yes to C-SPAN 3. So now the House is in session. Thanks for being with us today on the Washington Journal. The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Almighty God of the universe, we give you thanks for giving us another day. We pray for the gift of wisdom to all with great responsibility in this House for the leadership of our nation. May all the members have the vision of a world where respect and understanding are the marks of civility and where honor and integrity are the marks of one's character. As members take time in the coming week for constituency visits, give them the ability to hear the voices of all in their districts so that when they return, they are focused on the important work to be done. Bless us this day and every day, and may all that is done within these hallowed halls be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. And pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will entertain up to five one minute requests on each side. For what purpose uh, does the distinguished majority leader rise? Without objections, order. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the Jump Start Our Business Startups Act. Our nation's success has been built by individuals who turn innovative ideas into small businesses. By taking risks and working hard, our small business owners drive the majority of job creation in this country. Right now, it's just too difficult to start up a business. The threat of higher taxes and increased regulations has small business men and women and entrepreneurs frozen in their tracks. Small businesses and startups simply do not have the bandwidth to comply with Washington's red tape and yet they're the ones we are counting on to create jobs. Mr. Speaker, the JOBS Act will get small businesses and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs back into the game by removing costly regulations and making it easier for them to access capital. This legislation also paves the way for more startups and small businesses to go public, which will attract new investors and will allow the small businesses to grow and create jobs. In his State of the Union address, President Obama asked Congress to send him a bill that helps startups and entrepreneurs succeed. The JOBS Act that we'll be voting on today does exactly that. Our bill brings together common sense measures that have bipartisan support here in Washington and from business leaders across the country, including former AOL chairman and founder Steve Case. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize my colleagues who've worked on the JOBS Act, including Congressman Stephen Fincher, Whip Kevin McCarthy, uh, Congressman David Schweikert, Congressman Ben Quayle, Congressman Patrick McHenry, Congressman John Carney, and many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Let's build on this bipartisan momentum, Mr. Speaker. This week, President Obama offered his support for the JOBS Act. I strongly urge Senator Reid to take up this bill as quickly as possible and let's just get it to the president's desk. Mr. Speaker, the American people want to see us get something done and produce results. With the JOBS Act, we do have a window of opportunity for both parties in Washington to come together and produce results. We must make sure America remains the place where extraordinary success can be achieved by individuals who are willing to take risks and work hard. 
With that, the Speaker, I yield back. For what purposes the gentleman from Illinois rise? The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, Puerto Rico lost one of the towering figures of its labor movement, Pedro Grant, at the age of 92. Throughout his life, Mr. Grant was an example of the struggle for justice. He was one of the main leaders of the United Workers Movement, which was led to the revival of the labor movement in Puerto Rico in the 60s and 70s. By his example, Mr. Grant taught us that a life well lived is a life devoted to the struggle for justice and human rights and dignity for working people. He was a lifetime fighter against abuses of power and standing up for the little guy. He was a Puerto Rican patriot whose wisdom and strength will be sorely missed. I will say a few words in his language, Spanish, in his memory. Viviste bien. Siempre dijiste presente en todas las luchas de tu pueblo. Viviremos en tu sombra y en tu ejemplo. Gracias. Mereces un buen descanso, hermano. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Madam Speaker, I request a unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, modern-day slavery is alive in America. When Maria was 16, she was lured from Mexico to Houston by a man who promised her a better life. But when she arrived in Texas, she learned this scoundrel was in the slavery business. The slave master immediately put Maria up for sale. Now she was a sex slave, a victim of child human trafficking. Here's what she said. Every day, six to seven days a week, I'd have sex with seven to ten men a night during the week. And on the weekends, 20 to 30 men a night. Tortured and abused, the slave trader threatened her so she was too scared to run away. But she defied her ca captor and called for help. Law enforcement came to the aid and rescued her. The trafficker was convicted and sent to prison where we house these deviant international slave traders. Now it's time to prosecute the customers as well. Meanwhile, we have a duty to help and care for the victims of child sex slave, slavery, like Maria. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Does the gentlelady seek unanimous consent? Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in recognition of International Women's Day. Today is a day that honors numerous women who have actively and passionately participated, participated in various economic, social, and political issues within their communities. Women around the world continue to face significant obstacles in all aspects of their lives, including discrimination, gender bias, and the denial of basic human rights. Let's take a look at Vietnam, for example. Ms. Bu Thi Minh Heng, who was sentenced without trial to two years of re-education camp without a trial for participating in peaceful protests related to the Eastern Sea. Or Ms. Do Thi Minh Hung, a labor organizer who was sentenced to seven years imprisonment for advocating for farmers and workers' rights. Or Ms. Pham Tien Yin, who was unfairly sentenced to four years imprisonment followed by three years house arrest for participating in a nonviolent hunger strike in her home against the issue of the Eastern Sea. In the discourse of women's rights, these women are only three of the many voices who have been unjustly sentenced to prison without any due process. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me in recognizing International Women's Day and the women who are advocating for freedom and democracy in their communities and in countries such as Vietnam. Thank you, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nevada rise? Gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I come to the floor today saddened by the news of the passing of World War II veteran and Las Vegas resident Augusta Opus over this past weekend. Mr. Opus was part of a small community known as the Denied Filipino Veterans. Born in the Philippines on August 28, 1924, Mr. Opus entered into military service on behalf of the United States in March of 1945 and was trained as a military policeman. He served in the 12th Military Police Company and was honorably discharged in 1946. 
While he enjoyed a happy, healthy life following the war, one thing Mr. Opus did not share with his fellow World War II veterans was full recognition for his service and access to military benefits he had rightfully earned. In February of 1946, President Harry Truman signed the Rescission Act into law. This bill denied over 200,000 Filipino World War II veterans who served before July 1946 the benefits promised to them five years prior by President Franklin Roosevelt. The men who joined prior to July of 46 put their lives on the line for the Allied cause and helped us win the war in the Pacific, yet due to a technicality are not offered the recognition they deserve. With every day that passes, it is estimated that 10 of these forgotten soldiers die having received no answer or recognition of service from our government. Men like Augusto Opus deserve the recognition and access to benefits they earned. My district is home to four remaining forgotten Filipino veterans. Besides Augustus, we lost Francisco Sedula last year. And I want them to know that I am personally thankful for their service and will continue working to see them properly recognized. And I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from American Samoa rise? And the gentleman is recognized. Without objection. Madam Speaker, increasing American manufacturing is central to President Obama's vision for an economy built to last. The American manufacturing industry has expanded for 30 straight months. For the first time since the 1990s, we're creating manufacturing jobs again. The past two years, American manufacturers have created nearly 400,000 jobs across the country. Because of President Obama's decisive actions, we've also experienced a revival in the automotive industry. The last two and a half years, the auto industry alone has added more than 200,000 jobs. Furthermore, General Motors Company, once again, is the number one company in the world, and it recently announced its largest annual profits in history. Thanks again to President Obama's determination to assist this important industry to get back on its feet. Because of President Obama's leadership, the United States also is on track to meet this goal of doubling exports within five years. Now, more than ever, consumers around the world are buying products stamped with the three magic words, made in America. The vitality of the American manufacturing industry is crucial to the economic recovery of our nation. I commend President Obama for his commitment to our manufacturing industry and most of all, for his bold leadership and vision. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, it's worse than we thought. President Obama and his activist Interior Department are threatening an estimated 100,000 direct and indirect coal jobs, according to a new study. This is from the administration's proposed rewrite of the stream buffer zone rule that would cut coal production in half. Instead of developing one of America's most abundant resources, the Obama administration chooses to attack the coal industry and the jobs that go with it and would rather put the American taxpayer on the hook for failed companies like Solyndra. This is unacceptable. We need solutions and real growth to create jobs through energy development because the president's current policies continue to hurt America and are making our economy worse. House Republicans have a plan to stop President Obama's attack on coal. It's part of the plan for America's job creators that's being blocked by President Obama and Senate Democrats. This failure of leadership is irresponsible and it needs to stop. And with that, I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today to honor the United States Navy, who under the leadership of Secretary Ray Mabus have doing a fantastic job developing clean, green sources of energy for the United States Navy and eventually the world. The Navy is already flying the Blue Angels on biofuels. It is charging our communication equipment in Afghanistan with solar energy. It is on a path to half of its energy coming from clean sources by 2020 and the Great Green Fleet by 2016. In my state, we're building whole industries around this. Imperium Renewables, Targeted Growth, General Biofuels, Boeing, Alaska Airlines. We can power the future with clean energy. The Navy is leading the way. Washington State University is doing great work. And I know there's one great former Washington State student who's helping on this effort. And her name's Trudy. The gentleman yields back. 
For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? Uh, without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of the life and contributions of our colleague and friend Donald Payne. Don will always be remembered for his commitment to his community, which he served with distinction as a local elected official, to his country, evident by 23 years of service in Congress in which he championed education and fair labor practices, and to the global community where he was a champion for global health, especially malaria prevention and treatment. Don was a joy to travel with. He combined gentleness with strength, stood with and for the underserved and underrepresented, and always spoke of his commitment. But as he did, he had this warm-hearted smile. Even his eyes smiled as he gave voice to the voiceless. Our thoughts and prayers are with Don Payne's family, with his staff, and the people of the 10th District of New Jersey, and for all of us as we keep his legacy alive. Don, you will be missed. I yield back. The gentlelady wrote, yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Now, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks on H.R. 3606 and insert extraneous material thereon. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 572 and Rule 8, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 3606. Will the gentlelady from Michigan, Mrs. Miller, kindly take the chair? The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 3606, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to increase American job creation and economic growth by improving access to the public capital markets for emerging growth companies. When the Committee of the Whole rose on Wednesday, March 7, 2012, Amendment No. 10, printed in House Report 112 through 409, offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy, had been disposed of. And so it is now in order to consider Amendment No. 11, printed in House Report 112 through 409. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? I have an amendment printed in the uh, rule. And the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 11, printed in House Report number 112-409, <coughs> offered by Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. This amendment is very simple. Uh, we know that... Uh, and policymakers in Washington here know, uh, know that uh, entrepreneurship is at a 17-year low in the United States. We also know that small businesses uh, are, are the drivers of our economy. So what this amendment does is enable investors to connect with startups. It uh, takes away some red tape that is within securities regulations and it allows incubators, forums, and online platforms which only connect accredited investors to startups to be exempt from SEC registration as a broker-dealer if they, number one, do not charge a commission or a fee for their service, number two, do not handle the monies of investors, and number three, only permit accredited investors to use their platforms. This is a very narrow amendment, very specifically crafted, and in fact, uh, the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness in October of last year said in their report, the emergence of angel investor, investors and networks have also played a crucial role in the initial funding of companies, and that the Council recommends that clarifying that experience and active seed in angel investors and their meeting venues should, be, should not be subject to the regulations that were designed to protect inexperienced investors. This amendment deals with that subject matter uh, within the President's uh, jobs, 
Council recommendations. I uh, ask my colleagues to support this amendment, and I, and I uh, retain the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? To claim the time that would go to someone in opposition if there was anybody in opposition, which there does not appear to be. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support this amendment. I am pleased that we have been able to come together in a process that is providing some improvement. I, as I've said, I think there have been people in both the executive and legislative branch that have exaggerated the impact of these, but they, they, they are all helpful. I do want to make one point, though, that it is true that the President's been one of those who's been a proponent of this. It's been a very bipartisan and very cooperative process. And there is a statement of administration policy in support of the bills. I do want to make it clear because there will be some subsequent amendments that uh, I think will be controversial. This one is not. Uh, the next two uh, are actually uh, uh, not, I believe. Uh, but then uh, there are one, two, three, four that, that may be. And I want to make it very clear that the President's statement of administration policy, which supports the bills, or the bill with the package of bills within it in general, is in no way, and I speak for the administration on this having talked to them, uh, an expression of opposition to the later amendments. None of the later amendments, and members will debate them one way or the other, although I deeply regret that the Rules Committee only gave us five minutes to debate controversial amendments on each side. I think that's a denigration of the process. I would note we're probably going to finish up before noon today. And the notion that we couldn't have taken, or maybe 12.30, the notion that we couldn't have taken 20 minutes or even a half hour to debate a couple of these significant issues seems to me to be uh, very, very regrettable. But I did want to make it clear that there are amendments that will be coming up that are uh, not either supported or opposed by the administration. That is, they are not in opposition to the, uh, to the general approach. And since we only have five minutes, um, I will take a little of this time to note that, for example, um, there's one from Mr. Capuano, uh, who's a very thoughtful student here, to make sure that when we talk about holders of record that that's not a subterfuge, that the holders of record, uh, we are talking about limiting the number, that you don't get a whole lot of people listed as one holder of record. And I think that amendment by Mr. Capuano is wholly in the spirit of this bill. Um, Mr. Peters' bill, uh, one of the amendment, one of the things that we are talking about, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters, is to uh, talk about what the job impact is. These have been listed as a jobs bill. We have one of those foolish acronyms of which I'm not very fond to call this the jobs, whatever. Um, well, Mr. Peters wants to know how many jobs are really going to be created. I think that's very helpful. Uh, similarly, uh, the gentleman from California, Ms. Capps, wants to know about what the real impact is. So uh, I will reserve the balance of my time at this point, but I did want to make clear that several of the subsequent amendments are not in any way uh, derogatory to this bill. And in fact, uh, say, look, if this bill does what it says, let's know about it. I reserve the balance of my time. I believe I have the right to close. He reserves the balance of his time, but the gentleman from Texas has the right to close. Because the gentleman is not a true opponent. I'm prepared to from close. From North Carolina. I'm prepared to close. And from Massachusetts? Well, I will take the rest of my time to say this, um, and this is another relevant issue. This is a bill which does some useful things to reduce what the SEC will have to do in some of these areas, not primarily to save time for the SEC, but in fact to uh, try to uh, make it less burdensome for the companies that are involved. Uh, but that having been said, the reduction in SEC duties, which are really incidental to this bill, in no way removes the need for adequate funding for the SEC. And one of the things that has been troubling to many of us is a tendency on the part of the majority to refuse the adequate funding to the SEC that it needs to carry out its new responsibilities. That's especially troubling because the SEC funds do not come from the taxpayers. The SEC is funded by a fee paid by those who participate in the securities business, and in fact, as we are doing here, we are exempting the smaller people. So when we have the largest financial institutions in this country paying a relatively small fee, in fact, an absolutely small fee, we can fund the SEC adequately. And what we have seen is a disturbing refusal on the part of the majority in this House to give the SEC the funds it needs. We gave the SEC increased powers over investor protection. 
with fiduciary responsibilities over shareholder rights. We gave them increased powers, particularly over derivatives, which had gone unregulated for so long. We have had some criticism of the SEC for not moving more promptly. We have had some criticisms of the SEC for not doing a better job of enforcement. None of those are helped by starving them of funds. And so when we have a situation where the majority does the financial community the favor of withholding funds that the administration has asked for for the SEC, and we've asked that they be funded at that adequate level, and by doing so not only damages the enforcement capabilities of the SEC, but gives an unjustified present to the largest financial institutions, investment houses and others, then I think a very grave error has been made. So I welcome the fact that we are making some minor reductions in the SEC burden here as an incidence of trying to help the companies, but that does not justify failing adequately to fund the SEC out of fees assessed on the companies. The gentleman from North Carolina, the proponent, is recognized to close. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate the more conciliatory tone in today's debate, uh, and it's uh, fantastic, Madam Chair, to, to have the ranking member back in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in debating form today and, and uh, permitted to debate on the House floor. This amendment is about investors, incubators, and startups. Uh, we've got wide endorsements from 155 uh, of uh, folks from across America, both investor level, we have incubators, we have online platforms and forums that have endorsed this, including uh, the founder of AOL, Steve Case, uh, the founder of Netscape, uh, Mark Andreessen, who's also a, a renowned investor in Silicon Valley. This is uh, a, a great amendment that clarifies something that's very important for us to update in securities laws. I uh, certainly appreciate uh, the support across the aisle for this important issue as well, and glad it can be passed with bipartisan support. And with that, I ask my colleagues to vote yes. The amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina. Those in, figure, in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 12, printed in House Report 112 through 409. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? I have the amendment. The, the, amendment clerk, the clerk will designate the amendment. Report Number 112-409, offered by Mr. Miller of North Carolina. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Miller, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I hate to be the only one at the campfire not singing Kumbaya, uh, but I do part company with my president and with the ranking Democrat uh, on Financial Services Committee uh, in their support for this bill. I do fear uh, that if we uh, cut back on the transparency and we cut back on the investor protections, uh, it really is only going to take uh, one or two well-publicized cases of investors uh, losing their shirts, losing their retirement savings, uh, because they got defrauded for small business uh, capital uh, to dry up, to get harder to come by instead of easier to come by. Uh, but I do agree that government should not go to great lengths to protect people uh, who really can fend for themselves, who are more sophisticated, uh, and, and who really knowingly decide that they do not want protections. Uh, this amendment increases the exception from SEC <clears throat> uh, registration uh, to 2,000 investors, provided that no more than 500 are not accredited investors. Uh, I think the, Im the importance of accredited investors or their sophistication uh, may well be overstated, uh, but they are, in fact, people who uh, have well more than the uh, uh, net worth of most Americans. They have a net worth of a million dollars without uh, consideration of equity in their home, which uh, used to be more is, than it is now. Uh, or have an income of $200,000 for an annual income for $200,000 for an individual or $300,000 for a couple. Uh, more important, they actually have to fill out a form to ask to be an accredited investor. They have to opt in. Uh, they have to decide that they uh, do want to be um, outside of some of the protections of the SEC. Uh, so this will uh, limit uh, some of the effect of the bill to, in to investors 
who are somewhat more able to fend for themselves, are somewhat more sophisticated, and are more able to take a loss uh, in investing in a small business uh, that may be a, a, a greater risk of an investment, uh, may, an investment in which may be more of a risk, but may also promise more reward. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Uh, Madam Chairman, I rise to claim the time in opposition, though I do not oppose the underlying amendment. Without objection, the gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Um, Madam Chairman, um, this is one of those occasions where Mr. Miller and his staff, I, I extend an appreciation. We've gone back and forth in discussion over the last year of, you know, what should the number be? You know, we know we all came to a collective agreement that 500 was far too small for capital formation. Was 2,000 appropriate? Well, should it be 2,000 accredited? Well, what should be the unaccredited portions of that? Um, and I think this is we'll call a, an appropriate compromise. And, and I thank Mr. Miller for um, bringing this to us and helping us get there. What this ultimately does is allows an organization to rate, have investors up to 2,000, 500 of those can be unaccredited. The other 1,500 have to fill out the form, have to have net assets over a million dollars exclusive of their home, a uh, couple hundred thousand dollars a year income, 300,000 if they're a married couple. So uh, we're dealing at that point, we've made the decision that this somewhat more sophisticated population gets to participate, but they have to opt in and yet we still do not lock out those who are heading, shall we say, working their way to becoming that next sophisticated population. So, Madam Chairwoman, I um, yield back my time, but we support this amendment. Gentleman yields back. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number 13 printed in House Report 112 through 409. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Um, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 13 printed in House Report number 112-409 offered by Mr. Swikert of Arizona. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, and a member opposed will each control five minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Um, Madam Chairman, um, this actually amendment is, well, we'll call it a study amendment, but we've had repeated discussions on the, the difference between shareholders of record and beneficial interests. So think of this. We have just raised the number of shareholders that an organization can have. Okay, well, what if you're a broker-dealer? Do you count as one? Do you count as many? And does it actually make any difference in investor protection? So in this amendment, we basically say, all right, SEC, we believe you already have this authority. Please, over the first 120 days, look into this, see if it causes any harm. If it doesn't, make that decision. We thought this would be a rational way to approach the question because it, it was a repeated discussion within committee and just simply say, all right, if, if it's a problem, SEC, you have the authority. If not, let's move forward. But it's a good example of us not legislating something that at this point may be just folklore. Madam Chairman, I, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Oh, excuse me, reserve. Madam Gentleman Chairman, from reserve. Arizona reserves his time. For what purposes does the gentleman from Vermont seek recognition? Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise to claim the time in opposition, even though I'm not opposed, and I'd like to speak generally on Without HR Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's very refreshing that we have legislation that's focused on improving the business climate that we're doing together. And we've had some internal squabbles about whose name should go first. I think, uh, I'm not sure it amuses the American people, uh, but the bottom line here that should encourage the American people is that we have bipartisan legislation that is going to do positive things for the business climate, certainly in Vermont and around the country. And I want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Fincher and Mr. Himes, Mr. Carney, Mr. Schweikert, uh, for working together so well to bring this legislation to the floor. And there are a number of good things here. 
You know, uh, we don't have to exaggerate this as the answer to the real challenge we have in creating jobs. But you know what? Just selling this for what it is is a good thing. And it's a good thing because it does practical things to help us improve our business climate, particularly for small businesses. And for the rare time that uh, we have this opportunity, we're doing it together. But the legislation overall does a number of good things. The IPO on-ramp. Uh, that is going to allow companies that need access to capital fewer barriers to get access to capital, particularly our small companies, where the cost of putting together an initial, uh, initial public offering uh, is very significant, oftentimes prohibitive. That's a very good thing. The Access to Capital for Job Creators Act, it removes the regulatory uh, ban that prevents small, privately held companies from using advertisements to solicit investors for private offerings. So they are allowed to let the word go out that they are open for business and they want investors. That's a good thing. Uh, the Entrepreneur Access to Capital Act permits crowdfunding to finance new businesses by allowing companies to accept and pool donations up to a million dollars. Again, very practical step to take, good step to take. The Small Companies Capital Formation Act, Mr. Schweikert, my colleague from Arizona, pioneered, raises the offering threshold for companies exempted from registration uh, with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission from five million, the threshold, uh, to 50 million. And uh, Mr. Schweikert, again, you've been busy. The Private Company Flexibility and Growth Act raises the threshold for mandatory SEC registration for companies from 500 to 1,000 shareholders. We've got a, a company in uh, Newport, Vermont, that has been under a lot of regulatory pressure. They can't go from that fi over that 500 threshold. This is going to be very helpful, uh, Madam Speaker, to that company, get access to capital, and it's going to make certain that the SEC regulations are still complied with. Uh, and then the provision that raises the threshold for mandatory SEC uh, registration for community banks from 500 to 1,000 uh, shareholders, that's going to have a direct impact on a bank in Newport, uh, Vermont. Uh, so these are all practical steps. I don't think we need to oversell it. It's not the step that is going to get us down to the unemployment rate of 1 or 2 or 3 percent that all of us uh, aspire to. And there's a tendency in this body sometimes to oversell what we're doing. But you know what? We should minimize what we're doing as well. And these, again, practical, sensible, small business oriented steps that are taken on a bipartisan basis. This is a good thing uh, that we're doing. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Arizona. Um, Madam Chairman, I'm prepared to close. Gentleman is recognized. May I request the time available? Gentleman has four minutes remaining. Well, hopefully I won't take four minutes here. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, this amendment is actually very, very simple. Um, we're basically reaching out to the SEC saying, look, come back, make your determination, and let us know within 120 days. You know, if you see this as an actual issue. Um, you know, the language in here, you know, not later than 120 days after the enactment of this act, transmit its recommendations to Congress. Um, this is actually, I believe, a good, workable, rational um, answer to much of the discussion that happened in the Financial Services Committee. It also has the SEC stand up and say, yes, they have the authority, or no, they don't, and then transmit that back to us in the committee. Um, with that, Madam Chairman, I close. Gentleman yields yield back, back, and the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Now, in order to consider amendment number 14, printed in House Report 112 through 409, for what purposes the gentleman okay, from Massachusetts seek yes. recognition? The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 14, printed in House Report number 112-409, offered by Mr. Capuano of Massachusetts. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Capuano, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this amendment is actually just a piggyback on the previous one that we just adopted by voice vote. It's just a little bit more specific, and honestly, um, had I known the gentleman was going to offer the other amendment, I might have worked with him a little bit more to make it more specific. In some levels, it's redundant, but this particular one is more specific as to what the issue is. It's actually the specific issue that Mr. Schweik had pointed out, which is the definition of the beneficial owner. Right now, when Facebook went public, they allowed one or two or three, a handful of investors to be counted as one. Broker dealers can hold investments on behalf of thousands, an unlimited number of people. And the concept of having 2,000 or 1,000, I respect the gentleman's comments previously, that there's no magic number, 2,000 sounds fine, 1,000 was fine. That's all well and good, and there's no magic answer as to what that number. I think the compromises that we reach are actually pretty reasonable. At the same time, what it doesn't address, which is exactly what the gentleman said earlier, what it doesn't address is that each one of these 2,000 people, in theory, and in reality, often do hold the beneficial interests of tens of thousands of people. I'm not talking about mutual funds, but these are people that have the authority to direct the broker-dealer to act on their behalf. And all, I, all this says is it, it does very similar, but it directs the SEC to, talk about this, to look at this specific issue and to do it within six months and to come back not just with recommendations of Congress, but if, if they determine that it's an appropriate issue to actually act. Now, I don't think there's any disagreement that in that the SEC has the current authority under current law to do this action if they choose to do it. All this says is rather than simply come back to Congress with a proposal that if they see it, the appropriate thing to do is to act, that they should do it within six months. It's very similar. On many levels, it overlaps. It is a technical difference and a more specific amendment. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Um, Madam Chairwoman, I reserve the time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, um, you know, I appreciate um, our friend from Massachusetts. Um, I do believe, though, we're about to be somewhat duplicative to the amendment we just did. I accept there's a little bit more here that's a bit more specific, but it's, I hate to say, not necessary. We just passed an amendment that I believe accomplishes where the gentleman from Massachusetts is wishing to go, and therefore I don't see this amendment as actually being necessary. And reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Madam Chair, as the gentleman said in his debate on his bill, that even that was unnecessary because the SEC has the authority to do this now. That was unnecessary, and I agree. This, in theory, is unnecessary. The only difference is that this tells the SEC that if they determine that it is a problem, that they are required to act. That's the only major difference here, and they were required to act within a specific period of time. The previous amendment, also unnecessary, pursuant to current law, does direct the SEC to look like it at an issue and make recommendations to Congress. That's all it says. You could actually argue that that might undermine the SEC's authority to actually take action. I don't think that it does, but you could make that argument if you so chose. This amendment, I agree, it is overlapping. But it is not fully redundant, and it, it keeps the clarification that the SEC is empowered to act now to take action. That's the only major difference. I reserve the balance. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Arizona. M Madam Chairman, I yield myself the remainder of the time. Gentleman um, recognized. I, I appreciate the part of the argument here, but in the amendment we just passed, we basically, I, I believe, did what Congress is supposed to do. We asked the SEC to come back to us within that 120 days, say, all right, Here's your authority. Do this. Do that. Here's where we see a problem. Here's where we don't see a problem. Um, and actually, I think that's actually where um, those decisions should actually be existing. Yield for a question? Um, I do yield. Would the gentleman agree that the SEC is currently empowered to take these actions on their own without congressional approval? Um, that is, uh, re reclaiming my time, I actually do. If the gentleman agrees with that and the gentleman agrees that his amendment, excuse me, his amendment or his proposal, which I agree with, that we just adopted, doesn't undermine that authority at all, would the gentleman agree with that? Um, it, will the gentleman restate the question? I would, I'd simply ask the gentleman, under the amendment that we just adopted, your previous amendment, do you think and in any way that that undermines the current ability of the SEC to take action. I would think that it doesn't, but I'm simply, I'm not try, it's not a trick question. I'm no, just trying to build the no, record to be clear, clear as to what it does. Uh, rec reclaiming my time. Actually, where I think it's a really interesting part of the discussion is, all right, if I do believe the SEC actually has this authority, but at the same time, I also believe you and I and all of us in this body are responsible for the ultimate policy. 
that that policy should be coming back before us, particularly those of us in the Financial Services Committee, because we're going to also see it as it's tied into this whole package of legislation, but also other moving parts out there. And it's substantially for that reason, I must tell you, I preferred the amendment we just adopted over the one you've offered, because it does that um, provision of it comes back before us. Yes, the SEC may have this authority, but it, we're also going to be the ones touching it and saying, yes, but it needs to be in this context. And, it, and with that, I reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Madam Chair, I don't disagree with anything the gentleman just said. I happen to agree that Congress should exercise its responsibility every time. But I also understand, I also agree, that we have empowered various agencies across the government to take action on their own. At the SEC, we agree that the SEC has current action. And I would argue very clearly that this amendment, this bill, doesn't change the SEC's authority. If they would come out with a ruling tomorrow that defined beneficial owner, or owner of record in a different way, that they're fully authorized to do so, and all this amendment does is suggest that they do, actually requires them to do so one way or the other, even if they disagree with me. This doesn't direct them to agree with me. This simply directs them to act if they determine that they should. Uh, and I would also argue very clearly that if that's the determination that they make, that they will act anyway, uh, and that's the way it should be. That's all this amendment does is try to uh, draw a big, bold line under a potential massive loophole uh, that could be uh, utilized by not necessarily most people, but by a few nefarious people who might have an intent to defraud people. And that's all this is trying to do, close one more door, an obvious door, uh, that can be used by people that, uh, that shouldn't be used. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Arizona. Request the time available on both sides. Gentleman has two and a half minutes remaining. And on the... Two and a half minutes remaining. The okay. gentleman had yielded back his time. Okay. The gentleman um, from Arizona has two and a half minutes remaining to close. Madam Chairman, I'm going to reserve my time. Okay. The gentleman may not reserve time. Okay. The gentleman from Massachusetts has yielded back all his time. The gentleman oh. from Arizona has two and a half minutes to close. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I should learn to listen a little better. Um, Madam Chairman, I move to close. Um, I, look, I appreciate the discussion. Um, and I know we may be bordering on that line of being esoteric. I actually believe we took care of much of this concern in the previous amendment. If you are with us and agree, okay, we're literally looking at two tracks here. SEC does hold authority. At the same time, we also want this brought back to us if the SEC does see an issue. Then that's the proper venue. It is the proper venue that we passed in the previous amendment. Therefore, making this amendment somewhat duplicative. And with that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts. And those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it, the noes have it, the amendment is not agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. It is now in order to consider amendment number 15, printed in House Report 112 through 409. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 15, printed in House Report number 112-409, offered by Mr. Peters of Michigan. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters, and a member opposed will each control five minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Hey, madam, I uh, yield myself uh, such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm the uh, co-sponsor um, co of H.R. 3630 because I believe that this bipartisan legislation has the potential to create thousands of jobs uh, in the coming years. My amendment uh, improves this bill by ensuring that those jobs stay here in the United States and in our local communities. When I meet with constituents, uh, one of their top concerns is the persistent outsourcing of American jobs. Between 2000 and 2009, multinational corporations cut 2.9 million U.S. jobs while adding 2.4 million jobs overseas. Millions more jobs in diverse sectors such as life sciences, agriculture and sales could be moving abroad over the next few years. Annual job losses to offshoring has been estimated to be around 300,000. Those 300,000 job losses, of course, are significantly slowing net job creation at a time when we need it most in this country. My amendment will simply, simply require publicly held companies to disclose where their employees are located in their annual SEC filings. Are their employees here in the United States or are they overseas? 
While there is consistent concern in this chamber regarding new regulations on businesses, I think uh, we can all agree that employers know where they are sending their paychecks every month. And this bill specifically exempts newly public companies for five years. With unemployment above 8% and persistently high unemployment rates possible in the coming years, policymakers at every level of government must look at all credible options for creating jobs. Analyzing the effectiveness of past and future job policies is difficult without knowing whether corporations benefiting from tax incentives or other policies are creating the jobs here in America or abroad. Additionally, responsible investors have a right to know how publicly traded companies are spending their money and whether they're hiring and investing in the United States or sending their resources overseas. Uh, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and support the underlying bill, and I would reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan reserves his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I rise to claim the time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the threshold question I have to ask is how does this amendment help jumpstart business startups? What this amendment does is frankly require one more disclosure report. Uh, much of this, frankly, I do not believe to be germane to the underlying bill, but it is here before us nonetheless. It is one more regulatory burden. It is one more cost imposed upon our job creators. It is one more piece of red tape when already the Small Business Administration under the Obama administration has reported that total regulatory cost amount to $1.75 trillion annually which is enough money for businesses to provide 35 million private sector jobs with an average salary of $50,000. The same report from the Obama administration, Small Business Administration, has reported that 64% of all new jobs in the past 15 years have come from small business, and yet these small businesses face an annual regulatory cost of $10,000 five hundred and eighty five dollars per employee and so again I begin to wonder I, I, I know every single report every single study every single regulation perhaps has some beneficial purpose but the cumulative impact of them all madam chair is hurting our businesses according to a recent uh, Chamber of Commerce small business survey 78 percent of small businesses surveyed report that taxation, regulation, legislation from Washington is what's making it harder for their firms to hire more individuals. And what we understand from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, a division of OMB, during the first three years of the President's administration, we have seen a 95 percent increase in the average number of completed regulations deemed economically significant to our economy, almost double. The administration has currently proposed 3,118 regulations. Again, at what point uh, do you begin to say enough is enough? And I understand the purpose of the gentleman's amendment, but I think we know that we have lost far too many jobs overseas. It's not a, a matter of documenting the symptom. It's going to the disease. What is the root cause? Well, we know what the root cause is. <laughs> the root cause is too much red tape. It's bills like the president's health care plan, which is an anathema to small businesses across the land. 2,000 pages of legislation that has promulgated even more regulations. Talk to any small business person in America, and they will cite the president's health care program as something that's inhibiting job growth. This regulatory burden, almost double economically significant regulations imposed, that's what's chasing jobs overseas, taxation. The president is proposing $1.9 trillion more on taxes, much of it to fall upon small businesses, and we wonder why we're losing jobs uh, overseas. That's what needs to be documented, not the fact that it's happening, but the root causes. That would be more worthy of a study 
But at this point, the purpose of this bill is to help bring more companies onto this IPO on-ramp. This is at cross-purposes, and I would urge my colleagues to defeat this, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Michigan. Well, thank you. I'd like to respond uh, to uh, my esteemed colleague in a, in a couple of respects. Uh, one, uh, he mentions uh, that this is uh, outside of the scope of the legislation, that this is really not germane to what we're dealing with. I think uh, hopefully my colleague will agree with me that this legislation is about jobs. It is about creating jobs, but more importantly, making sure that those jobs are here in the United States. My colleague across the aisle wants to create jobs overseas. He can do that somewhere else. He should not be doing it in legislation before us. This is about empowering American businesses to hire American workers to grow the American economy. In order for us to do that, though, we need to have information. We have to know whether or not these policies that we are implementing are indeed doing what they are intended to do, which is create jobs in the United States. My colleague argues that this is somehow some incredible burden on companies to be able to report this. I want to remind my colleague that they already do report the number of employees they have. That is part of the SEC filings that currently uh, public corporations are required to file. All this does is ask where are those employees? Are they in the United States or are they overseas? To argue that this is somehow some incredible administrative burden would be to argue that somehow these companies have no idea where they are sending their paychecks and they're going to need to have some sort of uh, expensive compliance mechanism put in place. I would argue companies know exactly where they send those paychecks each and every month. They know if they're sending them to the United States. They know if they're sending them overseas. This is easy to comply with, but it is absolutely essential information for those of us as policymakers that hear from companies regularly that only if we were to adopt this policy they would create jobs. Well, if we adopt that policy, I would like to see that those jobs are actually being created in America and not overseas. We need to have that transparency. Additionally, this amendment is very careful to exempt new companies, those that are first filing. Initial first five years of a startup company do not have to file this. But what often happens with these new startup companies is that they start up in the United States when they then move to scale up operations and really start selling products all too often we see those companies sending those jobs overseas. And the scale up, most of the jobs, most of the good paying middle class jobs that are critical for a strong economy and for a strong democracy are being sent overseas. We need to know, we need to have the transparency. That's simply what this amendment does and would urge adoption. Gentleman from Texas. Continue to reserve. The gentleman from Michigan's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized to close. Uh, may I inquire to the uh, chair how much time the I have? The gentleman has one minute remaining. Uh, in that case, Madam Chair, I'll uh, yield the balance of our time to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fincher. Gentleman from Tennessee, recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I appreciate the, Mr. Peters' concerns, but this is about the private sector creating jobs. Uh, as we've been here uh, as a freshman, a year and a few months, uh, we have to remind ourselves in this body that jobs are not created in the halls of Congress. They're created in the private sector. And that's what this jobs package will do for America. It lets the private sector get back in the business of creating jobs. I do appreciate the concern, but th this is, we're looking out for America here, not overseas jobs, but bringing back, lowering unemployment, and letting the private sector get back in the driver's seat of our economy. Uh, American businesses don't need more mandates from Washington. I couldn't help but hear we, 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 and us, us, us here in the House. Let's get back to the people and the private sector. Uh, well, I understand, again, the gentleman's intention uh, may be to encourage more companies to keep jobs at home, I think this amendment would only add to the list of reasons a company chooses a path other than going public, which leads to less job creation at home. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan and those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, the noes have it, the amendment is not. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek I recognition? I request a recorded roll call. Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan will be postponed. 
Now in order to consider amendment number 16 printed in House Report 112 through 409. For what purposes does a gentleman from, gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 16 printed in House Report number 112-409 <laughs> offered by Mrs. Capps of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 572, the gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Capps, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise today to offer a straightforward amendment to H.R. 3606, the Jump Start Our Businesses Startup Act. My amendment would simply direct the Securities and Exchange Commission to, study, to conduct a study one year after enactment of the law to determine the increase in initial public offerings, or IPOs, resulting from this legislation. The study would also include data specifically on the increases in the manufacturing and high technology businesses, industries. Though I have concerns about the underlying bill, I plan to support it because I believe it will help small high-tech manufacturers, particularly many in my congressional district, to grow and to hire. However, I also believe we must take steps to ensure these provisions are actually working and our innovative entrepreneurs and small businesses are getting the support they need. Madam Chair, as our nation has struggled these past few years from the economic crisis, we have taken a hard look at what is required for our economy to grow and to thrive into the future. One thing we have all agreed upon is the need to make it in America. Of course, this means rebuilding and re-energizing the American manufacturing, especially in high tech. America's greatest export has always been our innovative ideas. For decades, we excelled at both imagining and building new products here in America. But in recent years, we've lost so many manufacturing plants and the millions of quality middle-class jobs that came with them. Small startups and local companies have been replaced with large global corporations that have exported our best ideas and our jobs overseas. This has to stop. Encouraging growth in high-tech manufacturing here at home is critical to rebuilding our economy to better compete in the 21st century. Whether it's in clean energy, defense, or computer science, the high-tech manufacturers are creating jobs, spurring economic growth, and helping our nation regain its rightful place as the global leader in innovation and manufacturing. What my amendment will simply ensure this bill is actually accomplishing what it's supposed to accomplish. It will ensure these, that these reforms are helping high-tech entrepreneurs and small businesses grow and hire more workers. I'm fortunate in my district to see firsthand tremendous success these innovative high-tech manufacturers can have in the 21st century economy. Companies like Transform, Innogen, Trust Automation, Maripro, Owl Biomedical, and Watt Techno Wyatt Technologies. They're all homegrown, often with ideas first hatched at our public universities like UC Santa Barbara and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. These companies, and so many more like them, are all innovating, expanding, and creating quality, local, good-paying jobs on California's central coast. These innovative businesses have weathered the economic crisis better than anyone else, and they've done this not by outsourcing jobs or cutting pay and benefits. They're doing it the old-fashioned way, by constantly innovating and outthinking their competition. They demonstrate the critical link between education, innovation, and our economy. Well, the reforms in the underlying bill are certainly important. We can't lose sight of the many other critical pro policies that help nurture and grow small businesses. As I meet with small business owners and entrepreneurs throughout my district, I hear about access to capital and cutting red tape, of course. But I also hear about the importance of funding our local community colleges and universities, improving local infrastructure, and protecting critical federal programs like the Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR, under S Small Business Administration. This bill certainly moves us in the right direction, but we need to do so much more. We need to, need to take up a long-term transportation bill that rebuilds our crumbling roads, bridges, and railways without partisan gimmicks and giveaways. We need to address the ongoing housing crisis that continues to drag down our economy and forces families from their homes. And we need to close the gaping loopholes in our tax code that encouraged companies to ship jobs overseas. Madam Chair, this bill is a positive step forward. Forward. But as many of my colleagues have pointed out, there is room for improvement. While I hope this bill can be improved as it moves forward, I plan to support it because it includes important reforms that will help small businesses. We must also ensure these reforms are actually helping the businesses that need it most, our small manufacturers and innovators. My amendment will make that happen, and I urge my